Community means supporting each other. And there is no place on earth that could exemplify this more than Rosemark. Been here 70 years. And as far as I'm concerned, it's probably the greatest, uh, greatest city in the world since it's lived here and the greatest people in the world. Hidden away in northeast Shelby County lies a little agrarian community which the common traveler passing by might overlook. Yet this small pleasant town has a heart and community bound by no boundaries, a place of life and fellowship reminiscent of the days of yesteryear, a true jewel of Tennessean life. This is a true community. This is family. This is Rosemark. Located right in the middle of four land grants, Rosemark began to be settled in the 1830s. Evidence of these land grants are still evident today, as many of the roads, Rosemark, Kerrville Rosemark, Mudville, and Brunswick, lie right along these past boundaries. Originally called Richland for the location's unusually rich soil, the name was changed to Rosemark in 1890 when it was determined that they could not file for a post office as there was already another Richland post office in Tennessee. New names were placed and drawn from a hat and Mr. Tarkington's suggestion, Rosemark, was chosen. It has been called this ever since. With much of the earliest settlers being plantation owners, it was not until the arrival of several prominent families including Gregg, Raymond, Mikoa, Wilson, Reed, Barrett, and Witherington in the 1850s that established a solid community, many of them coming from farther east in Lincoln County, Tennessee. It was in 1861 many of these community members signed a pledge for the construction of a reformed Presbyterian church as well as a school, what are now Tipton Rosemark Academy and Richland Associate Reformed Presbyterian Church to further solidify a community. For some years at its beginning, Richland had Sabbath morning worship services about only once a month because the church had to share preachers with other churches. However, the church continued well into the 20th century. In 1934, Dr. Frank B. Edwards began a term of four years as Richland's pastor. Reverend Edwards and his wife were especially interested in the work of the young people in the church and community. Answering a call to York, South Carolina, he left Richland in 1938. Dr. M. W. Griffith took his place as pastor at Richland from 1939 through 1946. These were the dark days of World War II. During this time, plans were developing for the construction of a new church building, and members were urged to buy war bonds for the church building fund. Reverend Edwards returned to service again in 1949 through 1957. It was during the second term of Reverend Frank Edwards that the present church building was erected and dedicated. On Easter Sabbath afternoon, April 9, 1950, cornerstone laying ceremonies were held and formal opening services were held on June 25, 1950 with over 500 people attending. This building still stands to this very day.
The school at Rosemark was also built on property donated to Richland ARP Church by Robert M. McCullough. This school was a wooden building built on one level, a hall through the middle, dog trot style, with a classroom on either side of the hall. Before the day's lessons could begin, buckets of water had to be drawn and placed into each room. Each bucket had a dipper from which everyone drank. There were potbelly stoves for heat, and each morning the ashes from the previous day's fire had to be taken out and a new fire be built. This was usually done by the older boys. The early school was always a center for community activities. It steadily grew in number of students, and the community began to feel the need for a larger building. On February 1st, 1912, the first load of lumber was brought into the newly purchased land, which still had corn stalks standing on it. All of the building materials were sent to Brunswick by train and hauled to Rosemark by teams of mule pulling wagons. When several loads came in at once, all the mules in the surrounding county were hired to help haul. The 1912 school building prominently displayed the name of the school, Rosemark School. The building was known for the separate entrances for boys and girls. The school continued to grow into the mid 20th century, hosting sports such as basketball. The 1950 to 51 construction of a new gym and cafeteria reflected the confidence of an immediate post-World War II era. The men of the community chipped in to build the wire frame football equipment lockers for the boys' dressing room under the south bleachers in the gym. The school raised money through its concession stands at all of its basketball games. The school also served the community as a place where young students could take dancing lessons or participate in musical programs. This was continued until the closure of the school in 1967. The closure of the school was like a death to the Rosemark community. However, in 1970, the school was purchased by Tipton Academy and named Tipton Rosemark Academy, whose student body is growing to this very day. Other parts of the community's growth include the Rosemark Telephone Company and the commercial intersection. The Rosemark Telephone Company was incorporated on December 9, 1911. It served the area north of Rosemark to the Tipton County line and beyond, all the way through the Bolton community to the south, to the east, just past Macedonia, and west, almost to Kerrville. However, on August 5, 1959, the officers and board of directors of the Rosemark Telephone Company entered into a contract for the sale and transfer of the assets of the Rosemark Telephone Company to the Millington Telephone Company for the purchase of $20,000. Plans to commemorate a museum for the old Rosemark Telephone Company are underway by the historic archives of Rosemark and environs. Not too far down the road from this was the commercial intersection containing the Thompson store Rosemark Bank and Trust Company, and the Cotton Gin owned by three of the Moore brothers who also owned the Moore's Brothers store. All country stores at the time handled both hard goods and soft goods. Hard goods such as nails, hammers, kerosene and kerosene lamps, as well as clothing, shoes, hats, flour, and canned goods. Even during the 1930s, the Bluebird bus line, which later became the Greyhound bus, had established bus service from Memphis to Rosemark, stopping at the Kerrville-Rosemark Road and Rosemark Road intersection. In the 1950s, the business enterprises provided the day-to-day -day activity. Politicians, including Albert Gore Sr., would come to the Thompson store to campaign. The school, however, was the heart of the community. When there was a play in the school auditorium, everyone in the community would turn out even if they had no connection with anyone in the play. Plays have been a fixture ever since the high school had been completed in 1912. The values of community and rural ways of living have not been forgotten by the people of Rosemark, who are still proud of their heritage. This led many members of the community to create an organization that would preserve and publish materials of local historic interest for literary and educational purposes. Chartered with the Secretary of State for the State of Tennessee, the Historic Archives of Rosemark and Environs Incorporated on October 7, 2009.
the historic archives of Rosemark and Environs immediately gathered as much as they could from personal interviews of people who experienced them, compiled them into a full book, an illustrated history of the people and towns of Northeast Shelby County and South Central Tipton County. The historic archives of Rosemark have also continued to grow the community, sponsoring the Rosemark Fair, encouraging other members of the community to preserve their history and further strengthen their community. If you don't know where you've been, if you don't know where you've come from, if you don't have roots, how are you going to know where you're going? When you can really promote livability and the attractiveness of the community, the heritage of the community, the pride of the community, then that's where you start to get companies interested in being a part of the community and a part of that family. The Country Fair then is an opportunity to give some real meaning to what is rural life in West Tennessee. Um, and because there was something lost, or something really lost, uh, with, the, with the fading away of the traditional fairs in, um, in all of our counties, uh, and Rosemark has some unique, very unique uh, aspects which lends itself to this particular event. Welcome to the Rosemark Country Fair, where we will celebrate the agricultural heritage of this rural community. We are uh, Power Honey, we are from Rosemark, uh, we're beekeepers, uh, we are, uh, just have some display of bees, uh, bee, bee equipment, uh, have some honey that we're selling, and uh, that's about it. Some of the equipment involved in beekeeping, uh, the bee suit, gloves, uh, uh, this is an uncapping knife that you'd use to uncap. Uh, we have observation hive with bees in it. Uh, we have the, actually the bee box down here. Y'all right here. We have the, the bee box here uh, where the bees live and, and stay. We have an extractor over here that you use to extract the honey right here. This is uh, the frame that goes in here and uh, just spin it, spin the honey out and then the honey comes out here and then you have the finished product over here on the table over here. And that's my son over there making a sale over there. <laughs> well, thank you for, uh, right, thank right. you so much. Thank Appreciate y'all. Thank y'all, man. I'm the owner of Rockin' Micros, as you can see, in Rosemark, Tennessee. Um, I grow micro vegetables um, to about the, the first set of the true leaf stage, and I sell to a bunch of restaurants in Memphis. Do herbs, vegetables, and edible flowers. So here we've got, I've got the popsicle sticks with all the labels. We've got um, bull's blood beets over here, some scallions. Two, uh, two different kinds of mustards, arugula, cilantro with the little coriander seed jacket still attached. So you kind of get two different flavors in that one. We got micro celery over here, kale, and these nasturtiums, these uh, leaves are edible, and if I let them mature, and, and the, the uh, blooms are also edible. My name is so. Bob Fleming, and uh, I have the Civil War and World War I display here today. A lot of these things belonged uh, from my, came from my, my family, uh, but not everything. Most of them are original, but there are a few reproductions, and the reproductions here are made directly from the originals. Uh, well, for example, the housewife here is, a housewife is what they called a sewing kit during the Civil War, and this one is made from one that is in the Museum of the Confederacy. The little buttons here, they're hard to see. They are um, hard rubber is what they're made of, and they were patented by Goodyear in 1858. These two wooden buttons are probably two of the most important things in the case. They are original Confederate uniform buttons. Some World War I original cartridges. Um, this was my granddaddy's. He was a, a doctor in Atoka. 
Now, this is bizarre. <laughs> this, this is my draft card from the tail end of Vietnam. This is my wife's uncle's draft card from World War II. And this is my wife's granddaddy's draft card from World War I. Completely war. This is a combination of wool and cotton. If you look real close, you can see the cotton in there. Mm -hmm. It's called jean cloth. Mm -hmm. Jean cloth is the same as jeans today. It's like blue jeans. This is the material they used in work clothes, and that's what they wore to war. Mm -hmm. This was made on a power loom. It, it, the power loom was, was uh, the material was made with, um, it, it was uh, made just like the original uh, with that same loom that they, they used then. The original uh, is in the um, Kentucky Military History Museum. And these are original buttons. Mm -hmm. Yes, we're representing Rosemar Church of God in Christ, my pastor, Pastor John B. Smith. And we have several things going on, but one of our main events that's going on, we are about to build the wall. And we're going to add facilities for our church, for our youth and our surrounding communities. That's going to be a blessing. There's a place for our youth to come and enjoy and um, be on the computer, help them with homework, whatever is available. We have that ready for them. And we have uh, several other events that's going on. We have CDs that's available for the ministry. And anything that you would like, we have it available. Our ministry is at 8815 Millington Arlington Road. And we're just right up the road there, representing the Rosemar Church. My name is Terry Newman. I'm out of Brighton, Tennessee. I've been doing blacksmithing for a couple of years and uh, do all different types of shows and things. I uh, try to, I don't try to finish any one particular thing when I'm here demonstrating. I try to, try to show different techniques, how to make a leaf, how to make a, uh, take a piece of square metal and put a, corkscrew in it or curve it. Uh, that's a simple hat rack that I've made. I also make handmade knives, which I don't have time to do at a show like this because it takes 30, 40 hours to do a knife. But uh, I've only been doing this a couple years. I've got a forge that I'm burning coal. I crank the blower supply and air to it and I get up in the neighborhood of 2,000 degrees of temperature. I heat the metal. I bring the metal out and I bring it over to my anvil. And I'll lay it on the anvil and start hitting it. So everything I do is with fire, anvil, and hammer. You have to know two things to be a blacksmith. Fire is hot and a hammer will hurt your fingers. <laughs> I think the, the beauty of rural living is that it is so uh, different from urban living and a person can enjoy both and have a very full life. You can live in an urban setting and work in a rural setting or just the reverse of that, live in a rural area and work in an urban area and enjoy the benefits of both. I think the world could take a, a lesson from Rosemar as far as how community works how they take care of each other in good times, they celebrate. In bad times, they help each other. And in the neutral times, everybody just gets along. And you, you walk around Rosemark, you see people smiling, smiling all over the place. And it's, it's just, a you come in to Rosemark, if you've been somewhere else and you come back and you see it and you say, I'm home. It's a place that you can call home. As the hustle and bustle of American lives drives us forward, there will always be places where we can come back to find ourselves, our foundations, who we are. There will always be these hidden places of Americana beauty. And you can always find that here in Rosemar, Tennessee. <laughs>